Hi, and welcome to our first ever Huskers W Weekly Show. We have many different videos and shows, but this place is going to be where we focus on all things Husker women's sports. So I'm Kelly Green, and joining me is Pat Radigan. We have some fun segments coming up with an interview with a basketball star and a Huskers women's basketball segment. But we're just going to start with some headlines. So Friday marks the beginning of our weekend at the new Devaney Center, which is going to be a very cool facility. What are you most excited for, Pat? I'm excited to just see the actual game elements because, I mean, last time you, you look at the, the pregame intros were fun, but they're still doing the choo-choo for Gina. They're still doing some of those things for, for the alumni and celebrating the alumni. You know, didn't really, weren't really familiar with the freshman players, didn't really have anything planned that way. Then we get into the match, I mean, obviously you don't want to celebrate anybody getting blocked. You don't want to celebrate too big on one side or the other. So, you know, Coach Cook talked about it. The players kind of talked about it, about how there was a scrimmage and nobody really wanted to be too mean. It was kind of a fun crowd and they were just getting acclimated. But I want to see what the competitive advantage means. I want to see what it means in big points. I want to see if Nebraska's tight in the game, what the crowd can mean. And the Coliseum was one of the smartest sports environments that there was in all sports, not just women's sport, but in all sports I've ever seen. So I want to see how that carries over and how kind of that same magic and some of the gamesmanship of the Coliseum, as well as you know some of the roof, roof, roof chants, what, what they come up with, some of the serve chants, just some of those typical things. You didn't really see a lot of it. People were saying you know maybe it's lost, but I don't think it's lost. There's too many of the same people from the Coliseum. There's too much tradition to be carried over. So there there. There are some people who were, who, and Coach Cook even mentioned this after the match, that said they were kind of hoping that it wouldn't be as good as the Coliseum, but they were blown away that it really was, and they, they really couldn't say anything negative about it. So when we see it in the game situation, when we see it actually come match time, I think we're going to be really impressed by what the Coliseum has. And what do you think the, the new Devaney Center is going to mean nationally or our place in the conference? And it's not just what it means and where Nebraska stands in, in the overall scheme of things. And, how Nebraska stacks up in the big picture. It's just, you know, men's and women's basketball, they've shared facilities, they have big facilities. I mean, there's been some things in women's basketball that are unlike any other women's sports on the NCAA level. But for a sport like volleyball, I mean, everybody knows that football is the driver behind every athletic department. And so women's sports have always just strived for that one, their sport, their flagship sport, the one that can generate revenue, the one that can be, I mean, you consider it, you know, 90% of all women's sports probably, or even a higher percentage, are considered non-revenue sports and are places that are costing people money I mean, obviously, it's scholarships. You're not really costing when you're providing some of those things. So it's, it's just not operating you know, business positive. And so when you have somebody like this who can set out and set a facility that's you know, over 7,000 people, that's got the suite level, that's got you know, those different tiers for boosters, for generating funds, for the match club, for the courtside seats, when you have something you just walk in and it just takes your breath away. I mean, Coach Cook has called it an NBA-type facility on more than one occasion. I mean, obviously, the NBA is a little bit bigger. And, but, I mean, you see that fake wall. I mean, you see not the, the false wall that they put in there for, for the club seating. You see, I mean, you walk in, there's trophy cases that are the columns out onto the court. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the bar has been set for other institutions. And if Nebraska can find a way to, you know, keep pushing here and keep building, I mean, they can push into the revenue, and they, they can do things people have never done with volleyball before, not just on the court, not just success, but the business purpose of it. The, you know, they already have the longest sellout streak of any women's sports ever at, you know, with Nebraska Volleyball. That's already active. But if they can just bring it to a new facility and bring it to that other tier, and then everybody starts competing, and then you see you know, five or six schools in the next 10 years that have 10,000-plus seats for volleyball, then ESPN rights start coming in. Then you see you know, the fans start booming up all over the country. So these kind of step forwards for some of the flagship programs in women's volleyball can take it to that next level and can show that you know, it's not just a women's sport anymore. It's a college sport. It competes with football. It competes with basketball on, at some schools. And you, know, you could say that there are a lot of Division I schools that might not have as many people at a football game as Nebraska has at a volleyball game. And, that, you know, it's, it's crazy to think that, but that's where they can be and that's where they're going. And so just to see what they can do to keep pushing the bounds and to keep stretching what other schools and what other programs are offering for women's sports, I think this kind of program, you don't see it anywhere else in any different kind of program besides, you know, the women's basketball that shares facilities with men. So for women's only facilities, it, it's, it's pretty top of the line. Absolutely. It's going to be an exciting year. So let's switch over to soccer. We know the women's soccer team had a pretty intense um, game at BYU. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, and that, that's shedding more light on more facilities to come. I mean, this is, and we're talking about this again in the wake of mm -hmm. the new 2,500 seat facility that's been um, that's been approved and it's going to be built for the women's soccer team. And this last weekend, they actually, unfortunately, they fell to number six BYU three nothing, and it was their hundredth shutout at home, their hundredth career program shutout. So you never want to be part of any record like that. But the record that they were probably at least excited to play in front of is they had oh, you know, over 5,100 fans there. And they set a, a record for how many fans were at that at game that 
it's not just in the seats. They were setting up barricades all over. They were setting up ropes. They had standing room only. And one of the girls, and you know, as someone who knows how angry you get when you get scored on playing soccer, I bet it drove Nebraska insane that they did this. But somebody from BYU scores a goal on a free kick and ran over and danced a little jig in the corner in front of student section all around and just going nuts. And if you don't see that happening in Nebraska, if you can't look at that video, and if you can't see the fans, see the energy, see the level, and compare it to something like the world's largest softball tailgate, and compare it, obviously, to volleyball and to some of those different things, what they did to fill the Devaney Center to send women's basketball out. And the year they had you know, 15, you know, 12,000 plus, or I don't know exactly the numbers, but sold it out basically for all the big 12 games when Nebraska women's basketball went undefeated. If you can't see that same energy, that same excitement coming to Nebraska when they have a facility like that, packing it and seeing if they can get more than 2,500 in that facility. And I think that they'll find a way to. I think they'll find a way to make a big event like that. But, you know, they have field-level seating back this year. Now if the track's done, it's only a little bit, but it makes the game that much better. And at Nebraska, if they're able to do some of those things, you know, one game year, a pack-the-field kind of game year, and have 3,000, 3,500, you know, increase the amount of people at the game, so I have 5,000 people and sell that place out, it's going to be huge for the program, and I think, again, it's huge for the conference. It's got those same kind of implications for building bigger programs. So if we can bring some of that to Nebraska, instead of just having the NCAA history, having some of the people who have played in the Canadian national team played in some of those different things. So instead of just having that history, having a history of the game day experience and having their own stadium and drawing regional play, drawing Big Ten tournaments and drawing big numbers, I think you can see it at Nebraska and just the sign of what you saw at BYU and the, and the enthusiasm you're seeing in other places for women's soccer. I think with a new facility, Nebraska's going to be able to match some of the same kind of stuff. Right, and one of our own players, Ari Romero, played for the Mexican national team. What does that mean for us? What's going to happen? And that's, that's kind of going off the same thing that, um, you know, that's facilities. That's kind of the, um, the off-the-field stuff, but Nebraska was also generating some buzz like that. And, you know, a few years ago with Morgan Marlboro and the USA team, and now Ari Romero is the next progression of that. And um, Katie Kreutner was called up to actually train with the Canadian national team. And like I just mentioned, it had some people who have contributed on the senior level and you know, contributed to the Canadian national team. But not just the fact she played the, the national team, but she's called up one of four collegiate selections called up and went and played where the Redskins play. It's not just she went and played, and she played on a nationally televised game. I watched all 90 minutes in crystal clear HD with the commentators that I'm used to watching for you know the men's national team action. And, and to see her there, I mean, they, they messed up her name a couple times, and you never really like to lose by more than you know, five or six goals to nothing. We don't put the actual scoreline out there on her. But to be playing against people who are, you know, and the, and the people she's guarding, and the forwards she's guarding, and the players for the United States are not only the face of soccer in the world, the face of soccer in the United States, but they're building a professional league right now, and they're just wrapping up their first year. And that's going to be huge steps. I mean, if, if Nebraska, if these big programs are able to feed, you know, from people from smaller countries, from Canadian, you know, Canadian internationals, from Mexican internationals, from even over, the, you, know, you know, European players, that if they're able to attract this and kind of do the same stuff with tennis... So if, if they're able to take places, you know, give opportunities to student athletes from other countries and from that, you know, that global scene and draw it together into the sport like tennis, like some of those other things, and, and build women's soccer from the ground up and send them back to the, their other countries to represent the Olympics, send them in the professional league and build a professional league in the United States that embraces people from all around the world. I mean, there are some Brazilian people, there are some people in Germany now who are major figures in the world of women's soccer. And so if Nebraska, if other Big Ten schools can draw in major talent, that you saw another player from Michigan who was on that Mexican national team, that if some of these bigger schools that have the scholarships, that have the funding, can use these programs to help launch leagues, to help launch the Olympic soccer, to help launch the Women's World Cup, I mean, that, that's where women's sports is going to be built, is where we have the fan bases, where we have the numbers that we do, like at the Division One level. And so for Nebraska to have individuals like that and for have people that can you know, be seen as to going to be major players in the international and professional ranks in the next couple of years, I think it's big and it goes right along with the facilities. So all signs are that everything's going right for the women's soccer program, and you know, it's just going to be interesting to see how the next couple of years play out. Absolutely, and it's going, to, it's going to be an exciting year this year. And yeah, we will have many more segments coming and weekly shows, so we are excited to let you in on all things Husker women's sports. So we'll take a quick break right now, and like she said, we'll be back. We have a look inside the Nebraska women's basketball team's gym and talk a little bit about post-play, mm -hmm. and then I was able to sit down with Jordan Hooper and talk about her experience this summer in the World University Games. So we have some fun segments coming up, so we'll take a quick break, and we'll be right back with more of our Huskers W Morning Show.